I'm Elena Cardozo. I'm a portrait artist and a sculptor. Hello, I'm Chris Stafford, and this is Art, the podcast where we get to know women from around the world of visual arts. This is Season 2, Episode 12. My guest this week is the English portrait artist and sculptor Elena Cardozo, known for the beauty she defines in her bronze sculptures and the dynamic movement in her work. Elena was born in London in 1965, the second of ten children to Colonel Benedict Cardozo, a military attaché in the British Army, and Caroline Cardozo, an artist and musician. Her childhood was subjected to the typical adventures of a military family when her father was posted overseas to places like Aden, Malaysia, Germany, Malawi, Ghana, Cyprus and Gibraltar. Eleanor's education began at a French school in Ghana, followed by boarding school from ages 8 through 18 at St Mary's Convent in Dorset. Her interest in art began as a small child, so it was with a degree of inevitability that she chose the City and Guild School of Art in London for fine art in sculpture, followed by the Florence Academy and Cecil Graves School in Italy for portraiture. She says, I think because I respected my parents so much and they had very high expectations, pretty much everything we did, whether it was piano or art or academics, they wanted it to be at the highest level. This episode is more than an interview. It's an intimate portrait of an artist's life filled with anecdotes that make you laugh, moments that inspire and revelations that make you ponder the nature of creativity. Eleanor's reflections on her boarding school days, her family's musical legacy, her spiritual journey, all add layers to her persona, revealing a woman who is as multifaceted as the sculptures she creates. We hear how being a gymnast and dancer through her teens informed her appreciation for athletic movement. Her love of beauty is evident in her work, which has adorned venues such as the Beau Rivage Palace Hotel in Lausanne, Cirque du Soleil, Harrods in London, Terminal 5 at Heathrow Airport, Westminster Abbey and the Palais Wilson in Geneva, to name just a few. Her work is primarily commission-based, but as she explains, she is also keen to explore other art forms. Eleanor and her husband Rupert live in Geneva and have three children, Cosima, Daniel and Harry. Eleanor, welcome to the Art Podcast. I'm delighted you could join me. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Chris. I want to start with what we were talking about just now before I hit record, and that was your riding experience, because as I mentioned to you, I spent some very happy years of my youth in Switzerland, and you said you... Uh, road as well through your father? Well, actually, I started riding when I was very little in Shropshire when one of the very few times that my parents actually came back to England between postings abroad. And we had two ponies, um, Cricket and Goldie, I remember, little fat ponies. And I used to <laughs> love um, riding and racing and riding bareback and uh, always always doing daring things, jumping things I was told not to jump and um, riding backwards, uh, doing gymnastics on top of the horse, uh, always doing different things. And then later when we arrived in Cyprus, my father started the um, polo there and um, he brought Jordanian polo ponies over to Cyprus and then the British Army were playing against anybody who wanted to play against them in Cyprus um, and so yes a lot of my summer holidays was in that metal cage on a wooden horse hitting that ball back on and on and my father telling me to do it again and again yes did you ever play a game of polo no, I don't think I ever even got out of that cage. I wasn't good enough. And I didn't think I was really that interested. By then, I'd moved on from uh, love of horses to, yes, I was a lot more interested in boys. By then. <laughs> well, we'll come to that, but we'll just join the dots up here so people know why I found you, because your niece is Madeline Bunbury, who was a guest on season one of our podcast here. And, of course, she has horses running through her veins, doesn't she? 
She loves horses. I think she loves horses more than boys. <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> she, I love Madeline. Yeah, that's very okay. I love Madeline. She's one of my absolutely beautiful, wonderful nieces who is a, a very talented painter as well. And she's really following her heart, traveling around the world painting. Uh, but horses were very much more in her life than they were in mine. I just had a short, a small chapter when I was uh, in my teens and when I was probably Probably, uh, nine and ten, something like that. Other than that, I didn't. I haven't really ridden that much. Well, you mentioned with your antics with ponies that uh, the gymnastic element to it, because I want to talk about that. Because uh, uh, with horses, anyone who know, who's familiar with vaulting is the form of gymnastics on horseback, of course, that we, we as kids would always do the vaulting. But you took it took the gymnastics a lot more seriously, didn't you? And and became a gymnast. Well, it's a funny thing. Uh, anybody who uh, interviewed me over the Olympics latched onto this story that I was a gymnast. It's made it a lot bigger than it really was. I did do gymnastics at school from really aged eight till 18 when I left school. Um, but it was never more than at county level. I would have loved to go on further, but I wasn't good enough, not nearly good enough. But we did all that, the floor, the um, beam, the all, all the different things. I, I prefer rhythmic gymnastics, but we never did rhythmic gymnastics at school. We just did regular gymnastics. And yes, I was in the team for, for all those years and we competed a bit, but not at a professional level ever. But I think they ran with that story because it fitted in rather nicely with the gymnasts that I was then sculpting. For the Olympics. Yes, well, that's a lovely story, isn't it? How, how you've taken that to its purest art form and with your sculpting. Tell us about the connection with the Olympics then. Did you go to London for the Olympics to follow the gymnastics in order to study the form for the sculptures that you were creating at that time? Funnily enough, no, I didn't go to London. I actually went to America where they were um, the, the rhythmic gymnasts were training a lot harder than in England, as far as I could see anyway. And they seemed to have a lot of backing and many, many little girls were doing that at school. And I saw, I found a school of rhythmic gymnasts and they were aged between 11 and 16. So I flew there. I asked them, would you mind if I came and uh, modeled them? I was actually asked. It was it was originally a commission. Somebody had commissioned uh, a gymnast from me. And I thought, well, you know, I've got to do this really beautifully. So, so I went out to America. I saw all those little girls. I knew instantly in in a second of seeing them which one I wanted I think there's something about proportions the eye sees and just knows that one is just exquisite um but I didn't want to make any of the others feel bad so I picked them all and said okay all come and I'll photograph you all and I drew them all but that particular one became my model for pretty much all of the sculptures that I ended up making um, and then I came home and I sculpted them in my studio here. And it was when they were in an exhibition in Lausanne in the Beaurivage Hotel, that, which is right. Lausanne is the home of the Olympic Museum. Yeah. And the Federation, the International Federation of Gymnastics is also homed in Lausanne. And some of those um, uh, directors came to the exhibition and one of them had the little uh, Olympic rings on a on his pinned onto his suit, and he saw them all and he said, "Ah, these wonderful gymnasts! So, are you taking these to the British Olympics uh, next year?" But, you know, I hadn't even thought about that. But then the moment he said it, I thought, "Hmm, that's quite good, England." Because of course I'd left England; I was in Switzerland. And so I did, and uh, I actually I actually wrote to Mohammed Al Fayed, and I said. I think you need some gymnasts in the Harrods windows over the Olympics and blow me down if he didn't say, yes, come and meet me. <laughs> so I did. And I ended up having a big exhibition in Harrods because of them. Um, uh, there are many, many stories over the whole Olympic gymnast thing. But yes, they did end up all over London throughout the Olympics. But it wasn't my idea at the beginning. It, it came sort of rather organically through another 
another route. Well, how fortuitous then. And so the ones that were in Harrods, did they sell on or what what happened to them? Yes. In fact, Harrods were amazing. He was incredible, really. He was like a, a, a father figure. And he just gave me a huge space on the fourth or fifth floor. I can't remember which one it was now. We're next to the Georgian restaurant. And everybody who came up there who were having uh, those smart teas, cucumber sandwiches and scones and things, (laughs) they would stop. They'd have to walk through my exhibition to get to the Georgian restaurant. And yes, I think I, I just, I sold to people who I never would have come across. He really, he was the one who who suddenly put me up in a, to another level of um, uh, of art. He put it globally on the map then, because I then had people from, from Canada, from America, from Beirut, from uh, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, all buying my work, which never would have happened, never. I've, I've always credited him for taking a little tiny cottage industry into onto a sort of global pl- platform for me. Well done you then. That's absolutely wonderful story, isn't it? Well, it was fortuitous. It was not really well done me at all. It was just his his kindness. He was quite naughty too. He, he's, a, he's a flirty man. So he, he, I used to joke with him a lot. But um, he really was, he was fantastic to myself. My daughter came and worked as well. She was ending her school by then. I think she must have been in the sixth form at school. And she came during her summer holidays and helped me at the desk and with the sales. Um, and every single afternoon he would walk through Harrods with his entourage and say okay it's tea time now and uh, off we would go and join him behind the green baize door that nobody knew he had an entire um, home of his own there his drawing rooms his city rooms his, and there we would have tea it was wonderful <laughs> what a lovely story yeah yeah I want to explore more your your sporting background because you sound as if you were naturally a, a sportswoman, and I'm wondering what else you did at school. Were you because you were born in England, but but you travelled so much. So you, did you do the sort of typical Commonwealth country sports that girls did in schools? Well, my early schooling was not in England at all because I was uh, I was born in England, but I think at about six months, I were, I, my parents, my father was posted to Malaysia, so I went there and. Um, there I was too little to do any sports. Just We were all very active, for sure. All my brothers and sisters, we were very active. Um, my father was very active and he was very sporty. He played tennis uh, for the army. Um, my mother too. But then there in those schools, no, there wasn't any of the team sports that we have in England. But then at eight, I was sent back from Africa to boarding school. And there... Uh, I love the sports there. It was netball, hockey, um, athletics, swimming, tennis, and gymnastics. And gymnastics was my favorite of all because I, I arrived, I was tiny compared to everybody else. I was very, very small. Um, but I must have just been naturally bendy. Oh, I've been doing dance. I think my mother had put me into dance or ballet classes when I was very little. So I'd had that behind me. But um Yes, I I did. I loved the sports. And then for 10 years, I I pretty much continued all those sports at school. And that was at St. Mary's Convent in Dorset that you were? Yes. And being one of a large family then, how did you all keep in touch with each other, with your siblings? Did some of them go with you or to the same schools? Or how did you stay connected through your early years of education? Initially, not at all. When I tell my daughter this, she goes, Mummy, it's amazing. You're not completely traumatized <laughs> because, <laughs> because she was so homesick when she went to school. But I wasn't homesick at all. I don't know. Maybe I'm missing some kind of little something in my brain or my heart, but I loved it. I was sent at eight from Ghana and uh, I had no idea when my mother dropped me off that I wasn't going to see her the next day. I don't think anybody really prepared me for it. I I had many little younger brothers and sisters and my mother was so busy with them. I think she dropped me off. She packed my cases beautifully. She prepared everything for me. But I think I just didn't really understand that tomorrow I'm not going to see her and not not for three months. Because she went back to Africa. Uh, I was in the school and um, I don't remember 
ever been really lonely or missing her or anything. I just was very naughty. I loved school. <laughs> I did everything I was told not to do. And I think it was almost, I think because I, I respected my parents so much and they had very high expectations uh, it, it, on a religious front and on a academic front, uh, pretty much everything we did, uh, whether it was piano or art or academics, it, they wanted it to be at the highest level. So I was trying to achieve that um, for them. But then, of course, I get to school and suddenly they're not there and suddenly I can be as naughty as I like or as naughty as I dared to be. So, yes, it was my kind of playground to be a bit of a rebel. Um, so uh, then a year later, my next sister, Anastasia, joined me. Uh, and then a year after that, my sister, Charlotte, joined me. Uh, so then we were three girls at the convent for a while. And later on, a few years later, two more sisters joined. So at one point we were... We weren't actually all six sisters together, but we were five sisters together. I then left at 18 before my littlest sister, Decima, she's called being the 10th, uh, before she arrived. So we were, yes, five girls there. But no, we didn't keep in touch early days at all, really. You'd almost put on half our um, hockey team together, but just the family. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, well, we did actually do, but not hockey. We we, we almost had, uh, not orchestra, but quartets. Everybody played piano and violin. So we were always playing things together, playing music together. Um, so, yeah, we did do a lot. We were a sort of unit, as it were. Every, it, it, none of us were really... Um, singled out for anything it was just yes so the girls go do this the boys do that you come you come together with those girls and the little ones do this the big ones do that it was more that it was more sort of teamwork i guess team cardozo <laughs> it sounds so crazy <laughs> listening to me saying this but <laughs> i don't know how to describe it it's so rare you know <laughs> So let's step back a little bit to Ghana and what you remember there. You attended a French school, but, you know, those very formative years, eight years as a, a young girl. What are your earliest memories of your life there? My earliest mem uh, memory in, in Ghana was probably when we stepped off the aeroplane and all of us had small, little violins. My mother had put us through this. Uh, it was called the Suzuki School of Music. And it was a very fast way for little children to learn the violin. And so we all had these miniature violins ranging in size from the tiniest violin you can imagine to uh, my brother ended up playing the cello. And we came off this aeroplane with the, all our violins in little black cases. And the Ghanaian guards at the airport thought that we were carrying little guns. I don't think they'd ever seen violin cases before. And so we were suddenly surrounded. And, and at gunpoint, my mother, we were put behind the screen and they made my mother at gunpoint open up her violin case. And she opened it up and she tightened her bow and put some little resin on the bow and started playing. And the memory of their faces as they heard this music, this beautiful music coming out of this instrument that they thought was a gun was just, I'll never forget that. In my whole life, I'll never forget that moment. Um, yeah. And then after that, yes, then I went to uh, the international school and within about a month of being there, my father looked at the work that we were doing and said, uh, no, you will never learn anything in this school because even the teachers aren't speaking proper English. <laughs> Go to the French school. So he sent us to a French school there. So that's where I learned my French. Who would ever know that I was going to end up living in a French-speaking country for 30 years? Um, I've just had such an incredibly blessed life that seems to have just seamlessly followed roots. Um, yeah, so I was then sent to a French school until I was eight. And then at eight, probably nearly nine, I was then sent to the convent in England as a boarder. Uh, my parents stayed abroad. I have this image now, Eleanor, of the sound of music and you and your siblings lined up with violins. <laughs> yes, a lot of people used to say that, the Von Trapp family. Yes. <laughs> Did yes. you perform together? Yes. 
No, not really. I think my my mother used to get the three girls to do things like the Gilbert and Sullivan, three little maids from school, are we? But for Christmas or when people came to the house, incredibly embarrassing. We hated doing it. But um, we performed, I think, for her. (laughs) Where's the music interest come from? Where, Where did that originate? Were your parents both musical? It's actually, yes, both sides of the family are musical. My father's side is very musical, but he was um, the second last in a family of seven. And I think by then they couldn't afford to do piano lessons and things anymore because the father was killed in the war and it was a single mother trying to bring up these children. And I think he never got the lessons. So he never himself played an instrument, but he has the most beautiful voice. He sang all the time. You always knew when daddy was around because he'd sing like an opera singer and he loved music. He played music all the time on on the radio. Or, um, But my mother actually actually physically plays piano and violin beautifully as well. So it came from both sides. And it was my mother who I think she was the one who really taught us because she was the one who who played. Uh, But my father loved it too. He was a great appreciator. Now, what about your grandparents on both sides? Because often as children, we connect to a grandparent. Talk talk to us about those relationships. Yes, I... I never had a grandfather. Both my grandfathers on my father's and my mother's side, they were both killed in the war as well. So many men in the war. It's, and, and my grandmother, I went to visit actually my grandmother's um, husband, my, my grandfather, Edward Brotherton Ratcliffe, who was killed in Tunisia. And he was only 26 and I went to visit his grave because he was out there on one of those. Um, he was in the intelligence corps. And I think it must have been the part when the British Army were out in northern Africa. My history is not really very good, but um, he was out there on Indian intelligence and he got killed there and he got buried there. And I went um, a few months ago, uh, October last year, I went to go and visit his grave because I happened to be in Tunisia. And uh, it's the most beautifully kept Commonwealth grounds. And they do keep these graves so beautifully. And, um, yeah, it's very moving seeing all those graves shining white and most of the names and the uh, the names on the tombstones and the ages were 20, 22, 23. My heart broke for those mothers because my boys are older than that now. And the thought of losing your boy at that age, there was one of 16 I had b- babies. So I had no grandfather on either side. And my grandmother on my father's side was very stern Um I, we were all terrified of her, and I didn't know her very well, and she died when I was quite young. But my other granny, Eleanor, she was called, and I was named after her, Eleanor Brotherton Ratcliffe. She was uh, a Royal Academy's painter. Um, she was wonderful and very naughty and had such a twinkle in her eye, and she always used to ask me what I was doing at school because she wanted the naughty stories. And quite often she lived in Oxford, and while my parents lived abroad, if ever there was like a half term or a holiday that I couldn't go home for because it was too far to go home, I would quite often go to her. And sometimes when I've been very naughty, I was gated from school. That means, you know, sort of expelled, not fully expelled, but expelled for a few days or a week or something. And I used to get on the train and (laughs) say to Granny, "Um, I did so well that they've given me a a week off school and she would wink at me and she would go, I know what that means. I know what that means, Ellie. Well, come on in and tell me all about it. And she was never shocked by anything. So I had a bit of an ally with, with that granny and I loved her. I really loved her. She was wonderful. And I think probably my um, knack of getting a likeness in portraits comes from her because she was a portrait artist as well. And she drew beautifully. She just uh, didn't, she didn't carry on her drawing long enough. So uh, I never really saw her drawing. Once I was, uh, once I knew her when I was old enough probably to know how she was, she just stopped. I don't know why she stopped. My children tell me all the time, never stop creating mummy, never stop. You've got to keep going till you die. So I do. I just keep drawing regardless or sculpting, you know, so the mischief came from her influence, did it? 
I think so, yes. I think my father's side pretty naughty too because I know some of my brothers, yes, they're pretty rebellious. Yeah, one particular one I'm thinking of, <laughs> yes. I think maybe naughtiness comes out of um, when you have incredibly or what you perceive as incredibly good parents. Um, and if the bar is so high and you just think that you can't reach that, you just go the other way. Um, you, you rebel against it because you can't possibly attain that level of, of goodness. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm wondering at school, though, what it was that you got caught for and got gated for. What was the mischief that you were making? Kind of um, everything that you weren't allowed to do, particularly when I was little, I had a kind of daring streak. So all my friends realized that, that no matter what they asked me to do, I'd go and do it. So it might have been the whole area in the school. There was a big area that was out of bounds, and that's where the nuns lived. Again, it was behind a kind of green baize door that you never allowed to go in. Um, and it was where sometimes they would keep extra food like cereal packets and things like that i would creep down in the middle of the night go through that door go and steal packets of cereal and milk out of the fridge and 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 run up back to the dormitory with it all and then we'd all have a midnight feast i had absolutely no fear of ever being caught and i don't know that i might have been caught once or twice but i always had such a quick um alibi or such a quick excuse i don't i think i was in trouble but looking back i think i just did it for the fun of it for the sheer hell of it and and maybe i thought i was gaining friends by doing stuff that nobody else would do but i would i don't know so that was and then we we would go when we got a bit older we'd go down to the end of the drive and and go and buy cider and uh, wine and you know alcohol and buy cigarettes everything that you were not allowed to do oh we try sometimes at night get out and go and see the boys in the school next door or yeah, it was just silly stuff, but just stuff that made you feel um, excited because it was naughty. <laughs> the forbidden fruits. Exactly that. And it's such a crazy thing in, hum- in humanity. Uh, and when I think about my Catholic upbringing, I just want to say how, how stupid is it that we're forbidden so many things? Of course, we're going to want to do them. So with my children, I did the complete opposite. You know, they, they heard that I was given, I was, we were all offered quite a lot of money not to smoke. If you're not smoking by the time you're 21, I'll give you a thousand pounds. I mean, this was a fortune when I was growing up. Um, I think most of us did it anyway. And I remember my, telling my children this and, and they said, oh, can we have a thousand pounds if we're not smoking by the time we're... And I said, of course you can't. Of course you're going to smoke. I mean, there are packets of cigarettes all over. You're, you're going to smoke. You're going to have, do this. You're going to do that. I expect you to do all of it. Of course you will. I hope you just don't get hooked like I did. So, you know, there was this whole different way of doing it. Uh, because it doesn't work. Forbidden fruits are going to make you want them. Of course, of course they are. <laughs> yeah, yes, the temptation. Yeah. So the religious part of your upbringing there, obviously the influence of, of the convent, was that something that has stuck with you? How important is religion to you today? That's a very, very good question because uh, spirituality is hugely important. It, it's everything. Um, for me today and and throughout my life. Religion as such, not so much. I've had a, such a battle, um, really, with the, with the teachings of, of various religions. I do know they're all trying to lead us to one path, to one true, the way I see it, one true God or one true divine at the end of it. But, um, and it's just humans, the human way of doing it. But now the spiritual side of me, I've, I've read so much now. I've come to a, a kind of realization and a relationship with a divine, with the God in a completely different way. And, and this, is, this pervades my whole life. It's, I think about it first thing in the morning, throughout the day while I'm working. Um, I go to bed reading books on spirituality, whether it's a, a course of love or he leadeth me or he and I. It doesn't really matter. They are, I'm almost just not interested in other books now. It's funny, I guess, because the subject is so huge. You can't ever get to the end of it. 
So yes, that I, I that definitely has left a huge that that's a huge legacy in me. But it's not what the convent taught me, and it's not even necessarily what my parents taught me. It's there somewhere. Yeah, it's not organized religion so much as it sounds as if you've reached a meditative state within the, your spiritual life. Much more so, more mystical, exactly, much more that. Yeah, but I think maybe that's happening to many people now. I think I think we're just maybe evolving uh, to a higher consciousness somewhere in the world at the moment, and maybe many, many people are finding that with these organized religions that I, I'm not saying there's anything really wrong. It's a route to it. It's the, it, I want to say don't burn down the schoolhouse just because you've left the school. There is a there is a reason for it and there is a place for it, of course, but I don't think it's the pinnacle. And I, I think that you can go beyond it. And how does that relate to your own children, uh, the importance of religion or spirituality in life? They, they are all actually very um, conscious of something beyond our physical material world. And I know they, they, they pray, they, um, my son, one of my sons gets up very early every morning. He meditates. Um, my daughter is very spiritual. Uh, she's married a very spiritual man as well. So that is a very strong in their life together. Um, and my other son, yeah, I think all three of them. It's very important. I think they, they, it probably goes through their life without them even thinking about it that much, but their life is ruled by it somewhat, yes. Your father, Benedict, he passed away some seven years ago now, but you refer to your mother, Caroline, who's still living in England. Yes. At the age of 82, you refer to her as a living saint. Raising 10 children is one thing, but why do you feel that she is a living saint in what other ways and, and and talk about your relationship with her oh my my dear 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 wonderful mother um i think because i watched her throughout my life putting herself last in everything she did everything to she actually put my father on a pedestal and we all looked up to daddy and um, we all did whatever daddy asked us to do, but particularly at the top end of the family. And I'm the oldest girl. So I have one older brother and then there's me. So I think their way of bringing us up in the beginning was much more strict. I don't think I know because I witnessed it much stricter than by the end when it was Decima who came 20 four years after me. Um, and by then, my parent, my father was 60 and my mother was 47 when they had Decima. And I, I just watched her doing everything to make my father happy, to make us all happy, to, 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 to make sure that we had all done our, our, our homework, had we'd all, we were all dressed correctly for church. We were all, she, she never really seemed to think about herself. And then, of course, she was always praying. A prayer came, it was in our life the whole time. That there was prayer before grace, before we ate. There was nighttime prayers. Um, there was Sunday church. Uh, it, was, it was very full on. Uh, my husband, who is not Catholic, uh, I mean, I think he just thought we'd just come from another planet when he met me. And it was, it was very troubling for him. Um, but he's he's a way better person than any one of us are. So somewhere the church didn't really do its job. <laughs> <laughs> what was your mother's background then? What, what 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 can you tell us about her life? Well, she was well. My lovely grandmother, who was uh, who was the naughty one. Uh, yes, I might just actually quickly say this because it is a theory that I've got. Because my granny was such a little rebel, and I was too. And my mother is this saint. I have this theory that it skips a generation. There's because the, the because then I gave birth to a little my my to a late an angel. I have my daughter is she's never done anything rebellious. She I never had to even tell her off about anything. She just was just an angel. Um, so uh, yes, my mother was one of three. She was the last of three. My grandmother had she married. She was older than her husband, the Edward, who's buried in Tunisia. Um, he she kept saying, "Oh, Edward, you're you're." I'm, a, I'm an old woman. Go and find a woman 
your age. You need a young woman. And he said, I don't want a girl. I want a woman. I want you. And so he married her. And she was about six years older than him, which in those days was probably um, quite rare. And then he were, they had three children. My mother was probably only a few months and then he was sent off to the war and then he was killed. And my grandmother never married again. So she was brought up by my mother on her own. Um, and she went to the same convent that I went to. So it was a bit just uh, a legacy. They just went from one generation to the other. I don't think my grandmother went to that school, but my mother certainly did. Um, and some of the nuns, when I arrived, remembered my mother. In fact, one of the little sister, sister Teresita, who taught me piano at the beginning, she kept calling me Caroline. I think she just thought I was my mother. <laughs> yes. Um, so that was her upbringing. She just was um, devoted to God. Uh, so, yes, I think of her as a little saint. Did she have any siblings? She had an older sister, Ursula, and an older brother, Edward. Edward was, Edward was unbelievably naughty. He was a real rebel. And, um, yeah, he rebelled against all sorts of things. Uh, he's no longer with us either, sadly. I think he must have got that wicked side from Granny too, yes. Well, I want to find out where the art in your life became because there's art, there's talent throughout your family. It began with you, I think, very, very early on. Can you remember those very early days when you were attracted to art? Yes, absolutely. I was drawing probably, <clears throat> I was probably only about three, four or five or something. I mean, before probably kindergarten age. And my mother was always drawing as well. There, were, there was always paper, pencils, paints. Uh, we never had a television uh, as children. We never had a television through all the countries we went to, never. Uh, the first time I came across a television was when I was sent to boarding school, aged eight, as I said. But so up until eight, we just uh, made things. We created things. Uh, so I was remember drawing, and my mother said to me, you're going to be an artist. Oh, look at this. And I'd obviously drawn a face. And instead of a little three-year-old or four-year-old round sort of uh, sunshine face with two dots for the eyes and a smiley smile, I'd drawn the whole eye with the iris, the pupil, the lashes, the eyebrow, the sort of shading around the eye. And, and uh I, she's never kept that drawing, but she's described this moment to me. And she said, I knew at that moment that you were going to be doing something creative in, in the art world. And then when I went to it, all through school, I was always drawing at, at St. Mary's. I was definitely the the artist. I was like the resident artist to go to for backdrops, for theatre plays, um, for posters. I did calligraphy. So I, all everything that needed to be written in calligraphy, I did that. Uh, and then I studied art at O-level and A-level. Um, and beyond. So, uh, yes, I've had it all through my life, but I think all of us did. We were always drawing and painting at home, and pretty much everybody. And then some of us have taken it on as a profession and some have moved into different directions with it. Do you remember the early feelings that you used to get when you were creating art? And what it really meant to you, what it really felt to you to do this, sort of on a very subconscious level? I definitely remember time either standing still or disappearing because a whole day could go. And, and that still happens to me today. A whole day could go and it felt like seconds. But then at the end, I'd seen what I'd created and it's almost as though it happened without me knowing I was doing it. I think I was so totally absorbed in the moment of creation that I was not aware of anything else, uh, nothing else at all. So there must have been a deep peace in that. And today I definitely feel a, a deep peace um, when I'm really focused on what I'm doing. Yes, and I always loved it. Uh, the, I would come back and just want to draw. If, if, if I was anywhere and there was time, I'd find anything, backs of, of books. Um, uh, I just draw all the time, drawing napkins, paper napkins. Yeah. You know, often we hold our parents up as unconscious judges. Was that something that you felt? Or was there a time when you cared less about what your parents thought about your choices or did they always matter? 
they always matter. Always. Even today. Yeah. I think I, I loved them so much I couldn't bear to let them down. I couldn't bear for them to not. I think most of my, certainly most of all of my school years, I was desperate to make my father proud. And I was very ambitious in, in all everything, trying to come first in everything. And I did quite often. And I remember Parents' Day, um, they would ask me to play the Chopin Nocturne for all the parents in the assembly hall when they came in. And then we would have prize giving. And I would uh, go up and get the prize for the French speaking or the art or the, the gymnastics or the something. And so I'd be going up again and again. Of course, my parents were never there to see it because they were abroad. Um, and I think that somewhere deep down, maybe subconsciously now, uh, I, I, now I can look at it and not mind, but I think for a long time that must have been uh, such a desire in me for them to see me do this, and yet they never saw it. So maybe I bragged about it when I went home. Mummy, did you know that I came first in this, 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 this? I don't know. I don't remember. But that was definitely a, a, an ambition for me was to make them proud of me. Maybe that's something from being one of 10 children. You've got to uh, make yourself be seen amongst the 10. And maybe that was the way to do it by being top of everything. I, I really don't know. But I mean, I never hold that against them. That, that it's, there, it's that that actually made me as ambitious as, as I became, I guess. I was wondering about the sibling rivalry. <laughs> Is that something that was always there and, or with particular siblings? Mm, I, I think some of, some of my brothers and sisters um, are not as competitive, and some are. And so they will definitely see me as one of the most competitive. Um, one of my sisters once said, I mean... Ellie, if you were, if you had a, an underwater swimming competition and you had to see how many lengths underwater you could swim with somebody else, you would rather die than come up before them. <laughs> and, and I thought, oh, you know, they're, they're right. I, it's so funny. I, I just had to come first at things. Um, and some of them just didn't mind at all. Little Cosmo, who was my, he's number nine in the family. And my father was really quite an old man by the time he went off to school. And he was just in small school and they did football for the first time. And so when my father went to go and pick him up, he said, oh, did you have a nice day? And he said, yes, we, we played football for the first time. And he said, oh, excellent. My father's such a sportsman. He'd, How did you get on? And Cosmo goes, well, they all seem to want the ball so much. I just let them have it as though he, it was just, why should he be bothered with kicking this ball around? He's such a genius as well. He would come first in every other subject bar sports. And it was almost as though this kicking this ball around thing was just beneath him. He couldn't care less. <laughs> so you were the one that was always competitive then. I'm wondering then if that translated to a performative aspect of your art. Do you feel that? when well, It sounds as if you have very high standards for yourself in your art and your sculpting, uh, but is it a performance as well when you're creating something? I don't know. I don't think it's a performance as such, but I'm definitely a perfectionist, which is, which is intolerable, really, because you never can finish and I love art that's not finished. I admire it so much in other artists' work, and yet I can't finish mine. Um, I, I can't leave mine unfinished. And a, a few pieces are unfinished, but that's just because I didn't have time to finish it before I started a commission for somebody. And that piece, I love it for its unfinishedness. But something about me keeps pushing me to perfect it. Um and uh, so I don't think it's really a performance. And actually going back to the competitiveness, now I have a, my, not the sister after me, but the next one, Lottie, she, she took her art into her profession too. And she was also very competitive. And she was so good at gymnastics that that's when I gave up almost because she was so much better than me. Um, so yes, she was competitive too. She's also a perfectionist, but in a different way. 
So you didn't want to come second? No, never. <laughs> I wanted to be top of everything <laughs> and first in everything. <laughs> yes. You were never going to settle for second. Yeah. So was that the kind of student you were? You went on to the City and Guild School of Art in London for fine art yes. and sculpture. So you had decided it was going to be sculpting. And I'm wondering what kind of student you were. You sounded like you were very dedicated at an early age. Mm. I, I wish I had been. I wasn't dedicated enough, really, because um, I was also doing dance on the side, and I loved that a lot. And my parents had moved to Gibraltar by then, and so they were away from home. And I was trying to pay my way in London as well, which was quite difficult. So I was trying to um, pay for my school fees. And if you're a sculptor, your school fees are a lot higher than if you're a painter because a block of stone or marble and all those tools you need to carve are and casting are a lot more expensive than a canvas and paints and brushes. So I, I set myself already a, a pretty impossible task of paying for everything, which I couldn't do and work all the same time. So I was drawing portraits of all the little prep schools around London at the time in my free time. And then I was working as a waitress. Um, the minute I finished at the City and Girls, I got on the tube, the underground and went to Sloan Square, where today there's a restaurant called the Colbert, which back it, in my day was called Orioles. And there I would put on my little black and white uniform and wait tables till um, after midnight when the theatre finished. And though, out of those proceeds, I paid my tuition. But what it meant is that I couldn't really devote as much time as I'd have liked during my classes because I would skip them quite a bit because I think, oh, I've got to get this portrait finished. I've got to get... And I actually didn't ever finish the whole course. I finished early because I got enough commissions to pay for other things. Like Cartier suddenly came to me and said, can you make us a polo player for a trophy for Windsor Great Park? I was still a student. Somebody else came to me, can you make a golfer trophy for this golf thing? So... I actually was making enough money to almost stop my studies, as it were, and but I needed the time to make all these things. So I started working on commissions before I'd finished my any of it, until I before I finished my training, really. So no, I wasn't as dedicated as I'd have liked to be. Um, and then I wanted to go to Italy and start learning uh, portraiture better. So I left City and Girls having done, I did enough. I did enough to learn all the sculpture I wanted to know. And after that, I didn't want to be taught anymore. I wanted just to do my thing. I think I was a bit like that in everything. So same with, same with the um, Florence Academy. I went there. Um, and I should have been there for three more years, and I only stayed a few months. That was partly because I was there. I'd learned quite a bit already, and then actually my husband, who is my husband today, came out to Florence and proposed to me. And so I'd finished my – I just left my course, and I got married and had children instead. What age were you? So when he came out to Italy, this was after City and Girls, I was 23. And where did you meet your husband, Rupert Fryer? Yes, Rupert. He, I met him when I was 16 while I was still at school but on holiday in Cyprus. This is in the days when I was in that cage, whacking polo balls in that cage for my father. Um, he was running the garrison in Cyprus and my um husband to be at the time was in the in the Blues and Royals regiment stationed out there for the um gosh I've got my mind has gone blank but he was in a different city in Cyprus and he was invited by my father along with many of the captains there for this big uh, polo launch I think and I remember a very tall handsome man sitting at the piano playing the piano but I didn't really meet him properly then until I, I think I was 90. I just remembered him very clearly. I remembered him in my head um, without really talking to him, just looking at him. And then about three years later, I was 19. I'd, I'd left school and I went to one of these military dances in London, which was rather like the return of the Scots Guards from Cyprus or whatever it was. And I saw him. Oh, I thought it was him and uh, went in with my, my friend at the time, my boyfriend at the time, 
And I said to him, could that be Rupert Fryer? And he said, oh, yeah, that idiot, yeah, could be him. <laughs> but my heart my heart started pounding. I thought, oh, my gosh, he's here. And I did, and I went up to him and I said, uh, um, you won't remember me, but uh, you're Rupert Fryer, aren't you? And he said, yes, of course I remember you. You're um, Eleanor Cardozo. I, I was so staggered that he remembered my name after all this time. So, um Yes, I met him through army connections, really, um, through my father, through the fact that he was in the army at the time. It was before he'd left and started in the banking world. That's how I met him. What happened to the boyfriend then? Did you ditch him and then uh, pursue Rupert or did Rupert realise that you were interested and pursue you? Rupert was quite busy that night. I think there were two other girls he was interested in at the time. <laughs> and no, I didn't ditch that boyfriend immediately. But I think it, it, yes, it hit me quite quickly that, yeah, that had come to its end. And uh, yes, quite a, few, a few months after that, I bumped into him again. And then we realized we lived almost in the same street. I was living in Hollywood Road and he was living in Redcliffe Gardens. And he, he stopped off one day after running. And I've been making homemade lemonade. And I said, I said, and I offered him some lemonade. And he was there standing there all sweaty and but so manly, all that testosterone. Yes, I was fairly smitten. And um, then we started going out with each other. And then after that, we, yeah, we got engaged after a few years. He came out and asked me in, in Italy. I think he didn't like me in Italy because I was uh, just seeing too many men. He he said he now tells the story that they were all these Uchis and Pucci's and Guarducci's and um, <laughs> who were taking me out, and he didn't like that. So he he came out and put a stop to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it obviously worked. Where yeah. where were you married? So we married actually back down in Dorset, where my parents lived. In um, uh, it was a, it was a girls' school, but originally it was a big church. It was Arundel, Arundel Castle, and there was a beautiful, beautiful chapel there with a, an amazing room with a great big circular minstrels' gallery and and staircase that goes up the sides. And uh, so we had we got married in the chapel. And then we had our reception afterwards there. And in those days, it wasn't a great big three-day affair like my daughter who had to have a, the night before, then the wedding and everybody sit down dinner and then a brunch the next day. Uh, no, it was just get married, um, have a reception, cut the cake, a few speeches, champagne, and off you went in your car and that was it. You were on your honeymoon night. <laughs> and where was the honeymoon? And the honeymoon was in the British Virgin Islands. It, uh, on an island called Byrus Creek, right next to Necker Island, which Richard Branson owns. And uh, he had just got married too. Or he was just about to get married, even though he'd been with living with his wife and already had his two children. They were little, but he'd never asked her to marry him. So he, he asked her to marry her at the same time. And so I remember our little tiny island that you could only get to by boat or helicopter um, suddenly it was filled with all these guests, but they weren't really there for us. They were to go to Richard Branson's island for his wedding. So I think my, my husband and I were the only ones not invited to the Branson wedding. We sat in a little Boston whaler with binoculars thinking, can we see any stars? You know, celebrity watch. But I don't think there were any celebrities there anyway. It was one of those wonderful ones where it was all the virgin record, you know, all the people he knew through the business. It was very low key. The children were bridesmaid and page boy. And I think it wasn't really much in the papers at all. But anyway, that all happened at the same time as, as our honeymoon. Yes. So going back to finish your education, then you felt that you had all that you needed in terms of education when you were at Florence Academy in the Cecil Grave School in Italy for portraiture. So you've got together as much information or as knowledge and you were already making money. When were your very first sales then? Because it sounds like it, there was an idea that you could make a living out of this from a very young age. Yeah. Yeah, you know, actually, my mother was already 
that sort of selling my work or using um, my work for, to begin with, it was as thank yous. Because if we were invited anywhere, we were so many of us um, that she felt very, um, I think, indebted to the person who'd invited us or for the lunch or the whatever it was. So she said, well, Ellie, could you draw this for them? Could you draw that for them as a thank you? So... I would draw their children or I would draw so and so uh, as the thank you card came it was always a drawing and then after a bit people would say oh god could, do you do who did this could you draw my uh, son could you do so I was selling portraits for nothing I mean like 10 pounds or 5 pounds but they were terrible I my mother still has in her cottage in in Dorset she still has I go when I see her I'm just I want to take them off the wall they're just so embarrassing they're so amateur but she still has portraits I was I drew when I was so young um of my younger brothers and sisters when they were two or three or four but something about them you can tell exactly who it is that I just got this likeness, even though the drawing was terrible and the and, and, and it was incredibly amateur. And so even at school I can remember doing things and people would say, Could I but could I have it? Or I'd say, Well, I'll swap it for this. So it was never it was bartering more. It was, if they wanted that drawing, I would get something of theirs. I must have been a hustler. I, I think I hustled always. So I was I was making money at school even before I left school, and then I was making money at, when I was at, a student at City and Guilds, um, and when I was in Florence, and then while I was in Florence, um, and I was working as an au pair to try and pay my way to be part of the, uh, to be a student in this school. Uh, and suddenly, while I was there, one of the sculptures that I'd done as a student sold in a gallery and that for quite a lot of money in those days. And that allowed me to stop being an au pair and go and get a, a flat of my own in an apartment in the Borgo San Frediano in Florence. And I lived alone in this little studio apartment for the rest of my time there. Um, so it was all through, yes, art selling. I was incredibly fortunate, incredibly fortunate that that just happened. What price was on that piece then that t ch really changed your life? I think it was probably about three or four thousand. It was a sculpture rather like the Dega ballerina, but without that tutu, that little tutu on it. It was actually of my sister Lucy, who was probably eight at the time that I used her as a model. And I'd done this. And no, in fact, it was a piece I'd even done at school. I model. It was the first figurative sculpture I did as a, as a at school. So I must have only been seventeen when I did that sculpture, um, and um, and it had just remained as a sculpture. But then I had it cast into. It wasn't even in bronze. It was in a cement fondant. It looked like bronze in those days. I was casting in cement, but then I finished it with a finish that looked like bronze. And it sold not as a bronze. It sold as as it was, like a, a resin. You call it. It's a, it's a cold cast, cold cast bronze. It's called, and it's a resin basically with cement inside. So it's got the weight and the cold. And yes, that's what sold for about four thousand. And that allowed me to pay rent for a, an apartment and stay in Florence, uh, not having to be a nanny most of the time. So then I could go full time into the school instead of just going when I had my uh, few hours. Now, that was a turning point. Yeah, clearly. So what year would that have been when you decided to move on and do this full time? So in Florence, so then my I was in Florence. In, so that must have been in 1988 or nine when my husband asked me to marry him. And then I went back. I got married. 1989. Um so I was 23, 24. And um, yeah, then I, we, then I lived in London and I started working immediately on commissions. People would just ask me to do things. Uh, and uh, it was either little head, sculpture heads of children or portraits, predominantly portraits at the beginning. And then it became figurative sculptures. And then we moved to Geneva. I had I, mean, I had two children very quickly, um, within a year of each other. I had two children, and then we moved to Geneva, and then I had my third one another year later. So I actually had three children in two and a half years. 
And then I started doing all the portraits of the children where my in the schools where my children went. So yes, I suppose I've just followed a very commercial commercial route. Um, maybe not a very artistic one at that because it's just commissions, really. And is that life now? Is it mostly commissions? Yes. I branched out of the commissions for a while, and that's when I was doing the gymnast, uh, gymnastics sculptures. Even though the first one had been a commission, I then suddenly loved that so much. I went in and did a whole lot of my own. And then I went where, over the Olympics. I realized, wow, I actually can sell. This is, this is really something. I can now afford to just do whatever I want and cast it in its selling. And I did that for quite a long time. But then uh, people would ask for big works. And some of them were works I really wanted to do. I did a six foot man in Luxembourg. And I, I really wanted to do that because it was so different from everything else I was doing. You know, he was a big, powerful, thick set man. And this was so different from these delicate little dances that I've been doing. So some commissions I took on purely because I really wanted to do them. And uh, that led me in a slightly different direction. But even to day now 80 percent more 90 percent of what i'm doing is, is private commissions just because people have asked me to do it yeah what do you find the most challenging now because clearly you have so much talent and all. it comes so naturally to you to do portraiture and and then sculpting yeah you're so kind what for you is the challenge though now I feel, funnily enough now, that I I almost want to go in a completely different direction. If it wasn't for the years, that are, the, the preceding years, where every year I've got so much work that I see it going into the next year, I think I would have done this long ago, moved into another direction, experimented into something else, um, done something completely different. Part of me is just dying to do something different. But then I look at what I've got to do and there's so much. And then I think, well, do I just say no and let all these people down? And a lot of them I've already said yes to. And it's on a kind of a list of things saying, yes, well, I can't do it now, but I can do it in 2025 or um it's a bit of a catch-22. I know that I'm in an incredibly fortunate position to have all this work, but at the same time, it's it's stopping me experimenting and doing something else that maybe I might be even better at. I don't know. I feel I have a lot more exploring to do. And with, of course, the commissions comes the pressure of delivering to a schedule as well. Yes, yes. Would you rather not have that weight to carry? It is, Chris, and and um, I love it and I hate it. I think I need it. I need the pressure in order to make me go in and do it um, because if the pressure wasn't there, I might be very lazy. Um, but at the same time, I don't like the pressure and and I get quite stressed sometimes. I always say to people, oh, I have no stress, I have no fear, I have no... I actually do in my work when I'm under pressure to finish something and I haven't got the time or when something is extremely difficult and demanding and I think I'm not good enough. And that's actually happened many times to me where I've, I've got something ex very difficult, very tricky. It could be a gymnast turning in a particular form that is so unlike the normal human positions that you, you're just wondering how on earth does that muscle work it does it looks so weird in the photo if i haven't got the live model and even sometimes if i do have the live model it can look so distorted that you then don't want to do it but you have to try and capture that um and often i think i'm not good enough and those are the moments where i i go almost into a deep focus where i'm really not there and that's when all the hours can pass. And suddenly I'll realize, oh, my gosh, it's it, it's eight o'clock at night. The light's gone. And, and, I, and I look at what's in front of me and I want to say, oh my God, who, who did that? It's all happened without me knowing. And that's the time often when I'm under pressure to finish something and I don't know that I can do it in time. And I have this wobble of not being good enough and I kind of get into a, into another 
I don't know how to explain it, really. I think I go into another mind or maybe something else works through me at that point. I have no way of, of, of explaining how it happens, but it's nearly always when I'm under a big pressure and strain to finish and I don't think I'm good enough to do it. Somehow something does it for me. Yeah. You strike me as a very strong and self-confident woman who knows their self-worth. So I'm, I'm thinking this um, imposter syndrome, as we call it now, seems almost, you know, it doesn't belong to you because you oh, are so capable. And I'm, I'm wondering who the Eleanor Cordova b- becomes at those times when you feel, do you have to close the door and have a glass of wine and everyone has to, what does that person become like? What What's Eleanor like during that? Oh, my God. Gosh, I'm amazed you see me in that light. Um, often I think I'm I'm an imposter and I think I'm just not. You know, when I look at what's what the work that is in the galleries, um, none of it, nearly n- this contemporary art movement, uh, the conceptual art, the contemporary art, it's so not what I'm doing. And I've had many galleries asking me to do stuff more like that. And I and I just haven't gone down that route. And then I think nobody's going to want this. Nobody that people don't want this. People don't like this anymore. They've gone out. This has all gone out of fashion now. Who wants this kind of sculpture anymore? It's I, I, I'm often very... Um, uh, doubting my talent, I often wonder, is it any good anymore? It's only because people keep asking me to do things I can do that I keep doing them. But on the on an artistic level, I think somebody once said to me, um, you're not really a real artist, Ellie. You're more of an artisan um, in that you're good at doing something in front of you, but you're not inventing brand new things and I really took that to heart and then he said but don't worry I mean Michelangelo was an artisan not an artist and I thought oh, okay well I mean quite good company there um but no I I definitely doubt it um and I do love my glasses of wine many <laughs> I love the wine and uh and I have a lot of other things that I love as well I love sports still and um parties and my friends and yes so I have a lot of outlet as well I just go in my studio and work in working hours on the whole and then my leisure time is the same as anyone else's do you feel fulfilled with your art at the moment Yes, at the moment, although I am feeling that, and I was just talking to my son earlier, I feel I want to do something different. It has particularly come in this year, and whether there's a movement of something going on in the energy even, or the consciousness of humanity somewhere where we're moving somewhere, we're moving in a new direction for something, I don't know, but I'm feeling it now that, um, yes, I maybe want to change directions but I do feel fulfilled at the moment because I'm busy all day long I'm busy and every day I've got things to do and I'm actually leaving tomorrow for Thailand um, for to meet all my family we're all going to have a family holiday there together and I've got so many things to finish before I go so l- last night I was in the studio till very late and the night before just trying to finish the work before I go but I do feel fulfilled I I get into bed at the end of the day and I just I think oh I did some good work and it's finished and thank goodness I know they're going to like this piece or I know I captured this person or yes so that's fulfilling I'm I'm very happy I I have nothing to not be happy about really which maybe sounds a bit like oh my gosh (laughs) <laughs> this person's got everything. Sometimes I really do think I have because I have my beautiful children and my beautiful life, and I, I feel incredibly blessed, incredibly blessed. Where does the music fit in your life now? Oh, music I love. I still play piano. I was just playing piano actually before you called me. We have two pianos in the house. We have one sort of smaller grand, which I play, um, and then we have one of those stand-up uh, Sony um Tony, I think all sing and dancing, you can make it do whatever you want it to do. And that my husband is brilliant at that. He he composes on it. He puts the, uh, all the other instruments in it. So I will play the melody because I hear melody uh, and he hears harmony. 
And so I'll play the melody on my piano and he'll play the harmony on his and we can almost we can almost get something that sounds almost respectable going on. Um so I still play, we play for fun. Um, and then music that I listen to, I listen all day long in my studio to music. Um, that inspires me a lot. I've made a playlist for myself with all the music, mostly from films uh, like Ennio Morricone uh, from Cinema Paradiso and Schindler's List, uh, uh, so many, and songs. And I just have this playlist that goes on for three hours and I'll play that almost on a rotor because I don't have to think. And most of the music, most of the film music that I'm listening to, it's not getting much louder and much quieter. It's very softly just goes through you. I expect some people would call it elevator music. Uh, most of it for me is way beyond that because the beauty of Ennio Morricone is, is way beyond elevator music. But a lot of it could, I suppose, be described as that. But it's particularly that so that I can concentrate on the work and it just seamlessly kind of goes through me, flows through me while I'm working. It's a big part of my life too. And the girl from Ipanema is actually your phone ring. Yes, yes. So when I hear it, sometimes I go running for my phone and think my phone is ringing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And do you have time for books? Is reading important to you? Yes, reading is very important. But uh, And I have about... 10 books by my bed where where my husband has one he's very organized and very almost ocd you know where he um, compartmentalizes everything and one book is finished it comes out and then he'll put it back and uh, take out another no mine i've got about 10 on the go and i will dip in and out um you know there'll be a bible there there'll be oprah winfrey's um soul sunday there'll be um Oh, The Power of Now, Eckhart Tolle, a lot of spiritual books. Right now I'm also reading uh, Diane Cannon's biography called Dear Carrie. She was married to Cary Grant, and I know Diane. She's the most wonderful lady in Los Angeles. She must be about 86 now. And we talk about spiritual things and we talk about God a lot together. But she's written this book, and they, actually there's a mini series that's just come out. I think it might be... It called uh, Archie. Yes, because his real name was Archie Leach, Cary Grant. So I'm reading that at the moment. But I kind of dip into all of them. I, I, I love reading. I devour books. But I never have enough time. I fall asleep in seconds. I'm, I'm hopeless. <laughs> I read them on, on aeroplanes and traveling. And if I'm in a waiting room somewhere, I'll bring my book with me. What does 2024 hold in store for you, Ellen? Um, Oh, well, I have a little grandchild, which is my latest complete fad. I just love him so much. He was born last March, so he's about to be one. So I'm, I've got my trip now to Thailand, uh, trying to finish some works before I go. I come back, then we've got some hiking in uh, the mountains uh, for Easter. And then I go to Los Angeles to go and look after my little grandson and stay with my daughter and son-in-law. Um, I think over the summer we've got a lot of weddings because that seems to be the time that our children are now all getting married. So there are weddings in Florence. There are also sort of 50th birthday parties, 60th birthday parties. Um, and so we're traveling a lot for that. Uh, I will go back and forth to America. I've got a, quite a few sculptures that I'm meant to be doing. I've got a life size uh, to go buy a pool for somebody of their 17 year old daughter. I've got another life size of um, uh, a, a, a lovely friend of mine who asked me to do it. And that's got to be installed by her pool through, through the summer. Um I've got another horse head to do for somebody and then portraits galore. Uh, I've, I've got a list of portraits I've got to do. So, yes, a lot of things. And you never know what's around the corner by the sounds of things. There's going to be new challenges, new doors opening for you. Eleanor, thank you so much for taking the time to do this podcast with me and share your story. Oh, thank you, Chris, so much. You asked me completely different questions from what I was expecting, but it was wonderful. You took me back down memory lane. And you can follow the links in the show notes to Eleanor's website and her social media. 
And if you're on Instagram, please do give us a follow too. We're at The Art Podcast. That's art with two A's. And we're also on Facebook. Just look for art. Always love to hear from you if you have any comments, questions, suggestions for guests as well. And you prefer email, you can reach us at hollowellstudios at gmail.com. I'll be back next week with another guest from the world of visual arts. So I do hope you'll join me then. Mm-hmm.